It is a, it's a pleasure for me to have a chance to, to come here. It's been a very exciting day to uh, meet so many uh, enthusiastic young scientists in the, in the labs here and to talk about some things we might do together uh, between uh, Australia and the centres here, Becker and the CGR centres, and see how this might fit into our broader vision of uh, what Australia might do usefully in Africa. And uh, as uh, Gabriel has said, this was a lecture that was originally given uh, in Canberra last week, and I promise you it may, not an, it may not be a new and improved version, but I promise you it's a shorter version <laughs> um, than uh, the lengthy one I gave in Canberra. But it is uh, the fundamental <coughs> point I want to make, and it's very relevant to Sir John Crawford, is that what we need, what the world desperately needs again, as it did at the time of the Green Revolution, is a combination of the best that an increased investment in agricultural science and research can provide, mixed with good sound economic principles, so we not only get good ideas, but we get good delivery of services to people through working markets, improving the lives of people in the poorest countries. But one of the reasons it was a privilege, and I, uh, like Gabriel, had an early experience with Sir John Crawford, and uh, I'll mention it only because it relates to some of the things I want to talk about. Uh, in 1975, uh, the then Australian government established for the first time an independent agency to look at, to, to, to run our aid program. Uh, it was then called the Australian Development Assistance Agency. It's gone through various formulations. It's now called AusAid. And they set up an advisory council. And uh, I had the good fortune to be appointed to that. Uh, and I hasten to say, uh, as a very young man, <laughs> given that that's 34 years ago. And uh, it was chaired by Sir John Crawford, who I thought was a very old man. And I think back, and he's probably not that much older then than I am now, but anyway, <laughs> times change our perception. But uh, he was a very inspiring figure and very important figure for Australia. But the, the point that I referred to in my lecture in Canberra that I want to refer to again is a couple of the initiatives he took and that lead me into the points I want to make. The first is that, and this was in the 60s and 70s, a, a radical view he took the view that development assistance was about partnerships, that it wasn't about donors and recipients, it was about partners working together to achieve change. Now we all say that now, most of us believe it, everybody says it, but he said it when nobody else was saying it. He really was one of the international driving forces for that transformation in the approach to uh, development. And he also, as Gabriel said, was a key player in the CGR and particularly at the time of, uh, he was one of those people who was associated with its development when it was working on the Green Revolution. And it's that aspect of it that I want to refer to today because whatever the critics might say, and there still are some, uh, I regard the Green Revolution as one of the remarkable achievements of human history. A transformation by the application of partnership and science and good economics that lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And uh, there's a lot to say about it, but almost everybody in this room knows more about it than me, so I won't explain to you things you already know. I just want to take one statistic from it and I'll apply it subsequently to our contemporary circumstance. But the proportion of the hungry in the global population was more than halved. And the figure I particularly want to refer to is staple crop yields in developing countries rose by around 150% as a consequence of the Green Revolution. So it is, it's that that I want to take and apply to our contemporary circumstance. Not everything about it is transferable, of course. Uh, circumstances, times are different, and you can't just take what happened then and apply it now. But some of the lessons are valid. 
one of the interesting analogies is that in the 60s, at the time the Green Revolution was uh, taking place, uh, there were people predicting that doom was at hand, that uh, there was no chance that we could feed the population that was going to uh, exist by the, by the 1980s. And uh, Paul Ehrlich, amongst others, said that uh, in the 1970s and 80s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death. It's too late. Nothing can be done to prevent a su substantial increase in the world death rate. And yet, by 1974, the change in wheat and rice varieties had led to India, far from uh, having increased starvation, meeting its own food needs. Now, that is the transformation that we need to look at. If we are to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, and particularly the Millennium Development Goal about reducing global poverty and hunger, then we need to return to that priority, to that partnership approach, and to mobilising the power of science together with sound economics to lift agricultural pro productivity. And we've been, as, we've been very complacent about agricultural production since the Green Revolution, and the results show. I know everybody was shocked in 2008 when we had that big food price spike. And there were some one-off short-term factors that drove 